Hello, I want to welcome you once again to worship. It's an important time when we come and give ourselves away, our time away, our spirits away to the holy and the living God. I encourage you during this time to open your hearts and your lives um, to Christ, to uh, being willing to hear and to see and to be a part of his work in this world. I invite you to enter a worshipful state, a prayerful state, where we are praying not to speak, but to hear a word from God. And now let us begin and worship God together in spirit and in truth. My name is Jim Clark, and I am part of a small group around the church. We call ourselves the Garden Club, or 
of the grounds committee. When we first started this group, we had probably eight or 10 people that would come and join us on a Saturday morning and we got things done that needed to get done. Over the years, we've lost a lot of members. We're down to now probably four at the best, sometimes less. We meet uh, on the first Saturday of each month at 7.30 in the morning. And we go around and we just do whatever we think needs to be done. We prune things, we rake, we pull weed. And not not hard work. We're just not able to get it all done. So we, this is an appeal. We need we need help. We need more people. Uh, this this prayer garden, this memorial garden, is so overgrown. That it's just not what a memorial garden should be. A memorial garden is supposed to be a place to remember. There are people here who have ashes buried here. I have a little bush here that's in memory of my wife. Um, so. We'd like to have it look a lot better than it is and be a, what a memorial garden should be. We just don't have enough people to get everything done that we would like to do. So we would like to invite anyone who is interested to come out on that first Saturday and each month at 7.30 and join us. We'll have fun, we'll get a lot done, and there'll be a lot of satisfaction in looking around uh, on Sunday morning and seeing how much better the place looks. Today we join our hearts uh, across time, across space together, in coming together and praying. Uh, I encourage you, if you have prayer requests that you would like for us to share, that you would send those to me. Um, my email is pastor at fumctitusville.com, or you can use office at fumctitusville.com, whichever is easier for you to remember. Today we want to remember and pair Ruth Allman. Uh, Ruth had a procedure this week and is doing well. Uh, her daughter is with her. She's kind of sore, but she's doing well. We want to continue to pray for Barbara Rao, for Charlene Rollerson. Uh, we want to pray for Larry Gilruth. Larry's had some health issues this week. And we want to remember all of those who are still struggling with having to be at home and being closed in at this time. I invite you now to quiet in your heart, in your mind. And let us take a moment of quiet reflection and prayer and then spoken prayer. Let us pray. Grace giving God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. For we know that he is God, light from light, true God from true God, and that he has come into the world to bring salvation. And we confess that even though we know all of the story, all of the pain and all of the sacrifice, we continue to slip into our own neediness and selfishness and sin. We become self-absorbed and look at what is best for us and what we think is best for the world. And we continue to be broken and sinful people. And we ask now that as we confess our sin, as we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbor as ourself, and we have not been an obedient church, that we come to you seeking forgiveness once again as we seek it each day. And Father, we thank you for the blessing of this church, of this place of worship. I thank you for the internet and for Facebook, for the opportunity to be able to be in worship, not only in this room, but across the nation and across the world. And I pray, God, that you would use these things that so many have intended for bad to be good to be used for good, to be transformed for the spreading of your kingdom in this world, for the spreading of the word, of the grace of Jesus Christ, of his death and his resurrection, which promises us a new life. And I thank you for all those in worship today, whether they be here or they be far away. I pray that you would touch their hearts with a word today that would give them hope for tomorrow 
and for every tomorrow to come. And Father, as we pray, I pray that you would make us victorious in this place, in Titusville and in every place my voice is heard today, that you would make us, not me, us, a victorious people in sharing the message of your love and in changing the world. I ask that you'd be with, with Ruth and with Charlene and with Barbara and with those who are struggling today, whether it be physical or mental or social, emotional or financial that during this time of pandemic, you would continue to bring healing and wholeness and you would continue to bring blessing upon us. Father, use us as your people called by your name to go into this world and to share the love of Jesus Christ. This we pray in his strong and faithful name. And in his name we pray as he taught the 12. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Thank you.
Uh, our scripture reading this morning is Matthew 16, 21 through 28. We are continuing in the lectionary, and we have gone from the season of Pentecost to the season after Pentecost. And this change in season is also signaled in our reading today as Jesus changes from teaching the masses to teaching the disciples. And as he turns his face toward Jerusalem and what must happen to him. I'll be reading this morning from the New Revised Standard Version, uh, Matthew 16, 21 through 28 again, uh, beginning with verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone want to become my followers, let them deny themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who want to lose their who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world, but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in glory, in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what they have done. Truly, I tell you, there will be some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading, hearing, understanding, and application of his word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love this reading. I may be the only pastor in the whole wide world who really loves this reading. Sometimes I wonder if I'm the only Christian in the whole wide world who loves this reading because it's hard. But it intrigues me. It shows me what is expected. As a t preacher who was writing on this said, she taught a Sunday school class the week before she was to preach on this verse and she asked them after she read it what they thought and how they felt, and everybody was uneasy and uncomfortable, and they didn't like it. And this one Marine spoke up and said, or former Marine, retired Marine, stood up and, or spoke up and said, but at least it tells you what you're getting yourself into. It's very honest. It's very straightforward. And I think sometimes that bothers us because it also is not in line with our current or the Jewish understanding of the kingdom of God and who Jesus is. Let's start right at the first. From that time on, Jesus or, or Matthew is telling us that there is a major shift in the gospel here. It's going from reaching out to everybody to narrowing the focus to the few. It, it's changing from what Jesus has been doing to what is going to be done to Jesus. And it's moving into those last moments, if you would, of his life where he really begins to show exactly who he is and why he came. He, he says to his disciples, I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem, guys, and uh, they're going to put me in old Sparky and electrocute me. And uh, the chief priest and, and the elders and the scribes, they're going to be the ones that are at fault. But it's okay. On the third day, I'll be raised from the dead. You ever notice how those last little words don't get picked up? Peter does it here on the third day. He has no concept of on the third day of being raised. All he hears is he hears Jesus say, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die at the hands of the religious people of our world. Now let's talk about the religious people. What were they looking for? The religious people were looking for a religious nation. They were looking for power and glory and fame. 
They were looking for the overthrowing of the Roman Empire as their slave master. They're looking for Israel to be raised up as the nation in the whole world. Sounds kind of familiar to what some people who call themselves Christian today are looking for. They're looking for power and glory and greatness and honor and all these things. And Peter can't understand a dead Messiah. Peter, like the rest of Israel, cannot understand a Messiah who comes and who suffers and who lays down his life and who dies. In his world, in his understanding, the Messiah is one who is lifted up, who is in control, who is in charge. The Messiah becomes the king of Israel. He becomes glorious, powerful, wealthy. And for all of Israel, this is something they cannot understand. And folks, if you listen to the news today, you will hear in our world groups of religious people talking about America becoming a shining nation and America is a Christian nation. And Jesus has been very clear. His kingdom is not of this world. He's already told them that. And now they're saying, you can't die, Jesus, because if you die, we can't have our kingdom. You promised us a kingdom, and, and now the Messiah has promised to bring the kingdom of David back to where it belongs, and now you're saying you're going to die? How can this be? You see, they're totally ignoring those last few words because they cannot wrap their minds around a poverty-stricken, dead Messiah. Many of them have probably followed like Judas expecting that one day he would be the head of the treasury of Israel and have access to a large amount of money. We're just supposing that based on other things we know about Judas. Peter is thinking, I will get to be, if you would, in our common vernacular, the vice president or the secretary of state or the president of the Senate or the, the chief justice of the Supreme Court because I'm one of Jesus' followers and, you know, the followers of the great always end up blessed in earthly terms. And then Jesus burst their, bur burst their bubble. This is not going to be like that. It's not going to be like that. I'm headed for Jerusalem. And, and these people, these religious people who have sold their souls, if you would, to become great in the eyes of others, are going to make sure I'm put to death. You see, when we look at the Roman Catholic Church today and we see the big high-pointed hats, they're called mitres, and the long robes, the only people in Jesus' day who wore long robes and pointy hats were the religious leaders of the temple, and they would walk around in these fine robes. And Jesus, as I read this week, pointed out, wore a robe that was made in one piece. Robes were typically sewn at the shoulders. A robe that was made in one piece was an undergarment. And apparently they have found extra biblical references to Jesus that says he looked shameful because he wore this robe of the poorest of the poor that was made in one piece. It was the robe of a child. It would have come down just below his knees and it was thin and it was poverty looking. You see, Jesus is already not giving the powerful in the temple, the Messiah they want. They want the Messiah to be in a fine purple robe that goes to the floor. They want the Messiah to have political power to be able to overthrow Rome. They want the Messiah to be who they want the Messiah to be. And here the Messiah says, I'm going to go be killed. I'm going to undergo great suffering. And it's all going to happen in Jerusalem where it all starts. Now, Peter, as I said last week, ever the one to open mouth and insert foot to thigh is not having this. Peter's saying, Lord, I forbid it. God forbid that, Lord. I'm not going to let you do that. You can't go and die because if you go and die, what's going to happen to me? You know, I'm, I'm like the second guy in command here, and, and I'm going to lose my power base, and I'm not going to be looked up to. 
and, and how is your kingdom going to come if you're dead and these people put you to death? How is it going to happen? And I want you to just remember what Jesus had said. Jesus has said, you're Peter, on, and on you I'll build my church. And now Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan. Reminiscent of what happened in the desert with Satan. Peter, you don't understand. Get behind me where a follower belongs and follow and quit trying to lead. Peter, just watch and shut up. Just follow me. You don't know where we're going. You can't lead. You're a stumbling block. You've gone from bedrock to stumbling block. You are setting your things, your mind, not on divine things, but on human things. What are the human things? Power and glory and honor and fame and fortune. And too many religious people today are seeking that. All we got to do is turn on the TV and see the magnificent edifices they've built. All we got to do is look at the houses they built and look at the incomes and look at the fact that they have private jets because demons ride on public transportation. Commercial airliners are filled with demons. I have to have a private jet. There's nothing wrong with these things until we put them in the place of God. And until we put our own power in the place of God. You see, Jesus came, was born of the poorest of the poor. And pretty obviously dressed as the poorest of the poor. And lived as an itinerant beggar preacher at least for three years. And Peter is looking at the positions they're going to have. We've already had, we're going to have James and John arguing about who gets to sit on the right and who gets to sit on the left as his advisors. And then Jesus says this. I can almost see him looking at him going, okay guys, let's come to an understanding here. I think you're a little confused. I think your vision is a little blurred on this issue. And I think you need to reconsider which, what you're doing. It's kind of like one of the old army movies where the leader looks at the men and says, okay, if anybody wants to turn back, now's the time. Now is the time. If you are afraid to die or you're not willing to give your life up for your country or for this battle or for whatever, you know, go home. It happens in the movie The Patriot. Mel Gibson's son in the movie is in love. And he loses his wife horribly. And he's torn between running away and fighting. And they're told, this is what we're giving up. It's our whole life. Uh, basically, the whole village has been burned to death in the church by the English general or colonel or whatever he was. And they know to go forward is to give up their lives. And Jesus said, if any, guys, you need to understand, if you're going to become or remain my followers, you're going to have to deny who you are. Take up your cross and follow me. You're going to have to deny your own feelings, your own desires, your own hopes. You're going to have to give up wanting to be the king's right-hand man. You're going to have to give up your desire to live in the castle, in a palace, and, and to serve in the temple, and to be wealthy, and to be looked up. You're going to have to give up who you are. Because as humans, we all seek the up. As humans, we all seek better than what we have. Our desire, as I've heard my father say many times before he died, and I was just a young kid, I want him to have better than I have. I want his life to be better. I want him to have more. And he was talking about human things. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you got to give all that up. You got to take up your cross and follow me. Now, two things you need to understand. Number one, the cross was laid, it was a, a beam that went across 
the condemned shoulders, and they knew what a cross was because they'd seen them many times, lining the roads into Jerusalem in the uprisings. And, and they give this cross, and, and the condemned has to take this cross upon themselves and carry this cross up to the place of crucifixion. And then they're mounted on either an upright stick or on many upright sticks together. But they have to carry the cross of their own will. And it's not just about the death that's going to occur, even though all of the disciples, except for one, and I can't remember which one or I would gladly tell you, died painful, horrid deaths. But it's also the fact that when the crucifixions were going on, men and women and children would line the road on the way up to the place of crucifixion, and they would ridicule and spit and tease and vilify those carrying those cross beams. You know, we often think that we're bearing a cross because we have a child or spouse that gives us problems or because we have sickness or because we have whatever. Those are thorns in the flesh. Those are not crosses. Crosses are the things that are public. Crosses are the things that call for our death. Crosses are the things that are our end. And, and then Jesus gets worse. He said, guys, just let me be real plain here. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. When you give yourself up, when you come in to worship and you lay it all down, and it doesn't matter what's going on, if it's nothing but an hour's worth of prayer, and you're good with that, when you don't expect your favorite person's going to sing, when you don't expect you're going to like the music, when you don't expect the sermon's going to touch your heart, when you don't expect, and you're good with it, you've given up your own desires, you've given up your own self, when you do that, you're going to find yourself. You're going to find your life. But when you're trying to save your life, both physically, by protecting yourself against others, by threatening others by being always prepared to fight by always having to be first by always having to have your way and by always having to be pleased with everything or I'm going to take my toys and go somewhere else you lose your life and if you lose it how are you going to buy it back You don't have anything else. And, and Peter is standing here listening to this. Can you imagine how Peter feels? Peter's been condemned by, by the Savior. You're a stumbling block. And Peter, if you want to come after me, you're going to die. You have to give up your right to everything, even yourself. And you have to be prepared to die for me. You have to be prepared to be sorely ridiculed. Jesus has said, my kingdom's not of this world. Jesus dies on a cross at the hands of the Romans and at the hands not of the Jewish people but of the temple elite. It's not about being a Jew. It's about being a rabble rouser. It's about being the person who politically stood up for the poor and the destitute against the temple. The Romans couldn't have cared less. Herod tries to get out of it. But Jesus knows that his way of life is the way of physical death and the way of spiritual life. He calls us, as he called the twelve, first to say, who do you say that I am? Do you believe in me? Do you trust me? Do you really believe I'm who? Who? I told you I was. Do you know that my way is the way of suffering, the way of denial, the way of poverty, the way of brokenness? Do you know that to follow me does not mean you're going to be rewarded in this world? It means you're going to be punished. You're going to be put down. You're going to be looked at in a negative light. Because the kingdoms of this world are about power and fame and fortune, and my kingdom is about equality, sharing, and giving away. 
Do you know that to follow me means death? But it also means resurrection. And it means when I come back, my Father will repay everyone for what they've done. You're not going to get it in this life, folks. Like that Marine said, at least we know what we're signing up for. We know that this is a D-Day mission on the, on the shores of Normandy, and most of us are not going to survive. Not if we're truly following Christ. And if we're truly following Christ, we are associating with the poor and the broken and the outcast. And if we are truly following Christ, we are laying down our life. And that's hard. I'm not there yet. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not there. I want to be there, but I'm not. I still have fear of death in this world. I still have fear of being broke. I still have fear of all those earthly things and I'm, I'm being transformed as Christ leads. He says, I truly, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before they see him raised from the dead and ascended into heaven and as we say in the Apostles' Creed sitting at the right hand of God the Father. So today we have some quotes. I want to read those to you in just a moment and then Lauren's going to have them up on the screen. Alexander Sols Hennison was a prisoner and he's talking about being sent to Siberia to prison. He says, from the moment you go to prison, you must put your cozy past firmly behind you. At the very threshold, you must say to yourself, my life is over. A little early to be sure, but there's nothing to be done about it. I shall never return to freedom. I no longer have any property whatsoever. Only my spirit and my conscience remain precious and important to me. Confronted by such a prisoner, the interrogation will tremble. Only the amount man who has renounced everything can win that victory. Dale Andrews says, What Jesus teaches is that servanthood will not escape suffering, and his messiahship will not escape death. G.K. Chesterton. Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. Where are you called? What are you called to? Where are you giving up your life? Let's pray. Father, as we have considered these quotes and these questions, as we have looked and found hope in you and life in you, give us hope in this world to follow you, to be willing to give up our very lives for you, to become martyrs, witnesses of your word. This we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I invite you to go today and give up your life. To go and lay down your life for others. To take up your cross and follow him. To go in his blessing and his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. shall not want he makes me to lie in green pastures he leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul I will dwell in the house of the Lord.